Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to week 20 of ENM 2020. Um, this is the question and answer session. And this week we had talks on two packages for, uh, for calibrating models and, and exploring models, uh, the SDM package and the, the Biomod uh, packages. Um, right now we have with us um, Babak Naimi, uh, who gave the SDM talk, plus uh, Mona Papage and, and Marlon Kobos. So we're just gonna start into the questions and see what comes of it. Uh, let's see, I will share my screen so that we can go over to the... Uh, oh, I hate this thing, there we go. That's the course schedule, there we go. So these are the questions that you all sent in this kind of salmon color. Um, anybody have a question they want to start with? Okay, I'll start things off. Uh, here on line 2347, what are the criteria for defining the number of pseudo absences? For example, if we have a, a thousand presence data, then how much pseudo absence data would be enough? I think there are a bunch of ways to answer this question. And so this will be a neat one to kind of go around the, the virtual table on. Uh, but I would, I would say it's certainly going to depend on the algorithm that you're using, because some of the algorithms are using contrasts between presence and pseudo absence data. And that's very different from what, for example, Maxent does which is to characterize the entire background. Um, and so needs to have um, the presence points included um, in, the, in the background, not just the ostensible absence data. Um, but the other thing you need to think about is the size and diversity of your uh, calibration area. If we take the calibration area as the area that's been accessible to our species, that may be broad or it may be narrow. And it may be very diverse, very, very heterogeneous environmentally, or it may be very uniform. And so you need enough points in your, in your uh, background or your pseudo absence data set to characterize that environmental variety. And so that may be in a large, heterogeneous area, that may be a huge number of points, or in a very restricted area uh, that's not very diverse, it may be fewer. Um, of course, the cost is often a cost of, um, of more computational load. So you have to, you have to weigh between those, those alternatives, uh, but you do have to think, how many points does it take to characterize my model calibration area. Any thoughts from the rest of you? Um, actually, for me, uh, I think uh, in general, I agree that it should be, um, I mean, it should be enough size to represent the heterogeneity and, uh, you know, the background condition, environmental condition that you incorporate into the model. But on the other hand, I think, um, I believe that uh, the existing method uh, are kind of, uh, they are kind of problematic. Uh, some of them are more, some of them actually I can say they are wrong. And probably the, the most correct is existing uh, state of the art method is the one that you just randomly distribute the point over the geographical area. And I'm, I worked a little bit on this, uh, this topic and I plan to write a paper and discuss these things, why they are wrong and uh, show uh, the reasoning. But if I want to summarize uh, my, you know, my logic is uh, that first of all, pseudo absence is not going to provide any information. It's like something that you let the model, the algorithm work. So you're not going to just inject 
or introduce any new information. If you consider, for example, those methods that you know consider buffer or like this environmental distance, you you infer the absence and you use that information that you generate and put into the model. If that is a really realistic, uh, you know, assumption, I mean, uh, if if your knowledge is enough that you can infer the absences, it's not pseudo absence anymore. But pseudo absence records are not going to be informative for the model. It means that if you have a method, a measure to calculate the amount of information over the whole entire study area, the information should be zero everywhere. But the existing method actually makes it impossible because first of all, you generate it in the geographical space and that would be dependent on the uh, proportion of different environmental condition. If you have some part of environmental area uh, you know, represented in the majority of the area, a majority of the study area, then you would have more pseudo absence there. It means that you have like a kind of imbalance between uh, different environmental conditions uh, in terms of unsuitability uh, that you just intentionally put into the model uh, based on the records you generate. So I think the method should, uh, I mean, if you want, you want to consider a right method, we should make sure that the records we generate wouldn't provide any information. It's like the same everywhere. That is the way that you let the presence locations, the only information that we have to play a role when you have, uh, you know, when you have the models fitted. I think that is the reason behind like why the extent is inform important. You you know when when you change the extent, you're gonna get different result because you know with changing the extent, the proportion of the different environmental condition is gonna be changed, and the models are fitted in environmental space. That's why uh, you know the ratio between presence and absence is changed that is <laughs> very brief Babak, <laughs> would you see a place for um weighting the the selection of pseudo absence data by sampling intensity if you have that information yeah it could be probably a practical solution but uh, those also, I think the source of problem here is that we do everything in geographical space. And if you do that, depending on the, you know, how uneven the different environmental condition is uh, across the study area, it might be even uh, introducing some bias, some additional bias. So I think in general, we should understand first, uh, uh, you know, I think the reasoning is very simple, but uh, I think people missed it. It's, it's like uh, we think more in geographical space and then try to, uh, you know, for example, using intensity or, you know, getting away from uh, the presence location, considering buffer or whatever that uh, the existing method use. But since they are all in geographical space, but the model uh, use, I mean, the models are fitted in environmental space, it's like a kind of uh, difference that uh, would affect. Uh, so I think there is no guarantee that if, if, if you do it in geographical space, it would fix the problem. Yeah, it's a, I was gonna say, it's a very difficult decision to make and, and there are, various levels of, <laughs> I don't know, nefarious, uh, uh, you know, solutions. Um, but I mean, it's a, it's a real problem because everybody, you know, um, needs to do that, needs to decide. I have, in this case, the question is I have, you know, 1000 presences, how many pseudo absences am I using? And, you know, where do I select them from? And it's, it's question dependent and, geography depend, dependent, like you said. And I think we had this conversation some weeks ago about environmental heterogeneity and how, you know, Great Plains versus 
the Andes represent big differences in terms of you know heterogeneity on um, a linear distance. Um, and the the buffer I've I've been confused about <laughs> the the strategy of using a buffer around occurrences for your background or pseudo absence. I've been confused for many years um, because I, in my mind, closer locations are more similar environmentally. And also, uh, so that's harder for the model because we are trying to, to find um, larger uh, differences in environmental space between presence and, and not presence. And so when we, when we select the uh, pseudo absence or background closer to the presences, I think it's, we're actually making it harder for the model to, to have a chance to distinguish between presence and not, not presence. And also, um, the, depends on the, the um, organism, but dispersal, I mean, closer to presences is where other or other individuals of the same species could, could be, I mean, aside of, competition and, and other biotic interactions. But yeah, I, I, I have doubts about the buffer option of selecting. So, so I think the logic was a pretty simple logic, which is to say it didn't have to do with setting up the optimal contrasts. Mm -hmm. It has to do with outlining what area has been accessible to the species. Yeah, the end. And yeah. And, you know, so that was just seen as a, you know, a symmetric dispersal kernel around points. And, you know, certainly it is true that cl close by points are more likely to be accessible than far away points. That may well, as you point out, that may well confuse and confound model calibration because those close by points are also the ones that are most likely to be inhabited but not detected by the species. Yeah. So, you it's know, hard. <laughs> Fernando presented some ideas about better ways to define calibration areas or better ways to identify accessible areas. And I think that's a clear refinement over distance based approaches. Yeah, but what I'm saying actually is that if if we if we understand this point, uh, if we accept the point that the pseudo absence are not supposed to play a role in the probability calculation, it's like pseudo absence without any information. We don't have any information about those records, and it's going to be the same everywhere. That's why it means no information. If we, ask, if we find a way to generate such the records, then it wouldn't be sensitive to the extent of the area. It wouldn't be sensitive to, you know, those accessible or not or whatever. I think all of these issues that uh, are uh, out, I mean, are discussed like accessibility or, uh, you know, uh, these things I think uh, related to the wrong way of generating the records. But I'm asked this the same question about because uh, the students ask, okay, so what should we do about the number? And I always say that uh, if, if uh, you don't want to compare, if you don't have several species to compare, if, if you want, because it would affect the measure of the probability, calculated probability. If you want to compare a species, different species, and you want to have the estimated value comparable, then it's important to find a rule that the proportion of the presence to absence given the study area, the size of a study area, is comparable. But uh, but with the assumption that uh, you know they're, they're all the samplings are done this I mean with the same uh, scheme <laughs> so there is no bias in terms of the differences in the sampling efforts. But uh, on the other hand, if there is no such comparison, it you should not be worried about the actual number. It can be as much as it uh, represents the area. So it's not like a big deal to 
have a little bit, a little bit more or less. So when you say that the pseudo absence should represent no information, do you mean no information, like no um, biologically informed, but no you biological know, information, or just I like these so models? This, I was gonna say maybe like uh, virtual absences, something like that, or uh, I'm not sure what do you mean about virtual, <laughs> but in 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 general, you know, these these models, a statistical model, are data driven, based on you know what we provide to the algorithm. They, you know, they characterize that they make the model. So these data are, you know, information that we, the, it's like training procedure, it's training data. The models are trained based on the data that we provide. And if we put presence and absence to the model, the only information that are reliable and trustable are presence. And the absence are, you know, at the name, the name just says it, it's pseudo absence. It's not gonna, mm -hmm. we don't have any information, any knowledge about absence, right? That is the assumption. If we have such knowledge and we can use them to generate absences, we should not name it pseudo absence. It's like inferred absence or whatever. But yeah. if it's pseudo absence, these, that, that, that part of data are not supposed to to inject any information to the algorithm and the algorithm should just make decision about suitability based on the presence part. Mm -hmm. So just imagine uh, why that caused a problem. Just imagine we have two environmental condition in the study area, environmental condition A and B, and A is more suitable than B. Okay, A is highly suitable, B is like less suitable. But A is three times bigger in size in the study area compared to B. If you generate pseudo absence, you're gonna have more suitability for B than A because you have a lot of absence in A and uh, you know, it's, it, it's defined by the geographical size, right? That is the way, the, the reason that, uh, you know, this distribution of uh, absence, uh, if, if you just make decision about absence records, about the suitability, since in the environmental A, environmental condition, you have more absence, that's why you can, the algorithm just uh, understand that it's less suitable, but in fact, it's more suitable. That is the, 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 you know, the reason that uh, we should make sure that these absence record are just considered the same level of unsuitability over all the environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're talking about two subtly different topics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> One is whatever the algorithm we use, what information do the pseudo absence data provide? And in that sense, I concur with you completely, Babak, which is to say we should be using tools that as much as is possible avoid over-interpreting this non-information, you know, essentially where nobody has yet sampled and found our species to be present. And so Mona and I have a paper from, from 12 years ago where we, we made that point about model evaluation, where we basically said our confidence in presence data is like this, and the information content and absence data is very low. And so we pushed the evaluation statistics to emphasize correct prediction of presences rather than uh, correct prediction of absences. So I, I think on that point, I think we're on the same wavelength. My, my other concern, or the other thing we've kind of touched on, is what is the area over which we're calibrating these models? And so you brought up the distance-based and, and the geographic-based, as Mona mentioned, uh, buffer-based uh, calibration area choice. Now, obviously, that sets bounds on where pseudo-absence data can come from. But we've already agreed that we don't want the pseudo absence data 
to have much of a voice in this. Yeah, exactly. But let's imagine a tropical species that is happiest in the hottest and most humid equatorial climates possible, but which has, which is endemic to Madagascar. So it's all going to be up there at the north end of Madagascar. And probably even the most tropical parts of Madagascar are going to feel pretty seasonal and kind of marginal for our species. The universe for that species does not get more equatorial and more uh, humid tropical than whatever the latitude of northern Madagascar is. And so I'm very focused on explicitly in geographic space, picking the, the limits of the area across which we do our, our comparisons, simply because a species like that can never experience and will never experience the Congo Basin or the Amazon. And so that I think is a biogeographic question and that sets the limits of our interpretation of these models. We can have a model for our Madagascar uh, endemic. We can never ever speak to how happy it would be in an equatorial environment. We can guess, we can extrapolate, but we can never speak to it in a data-driven sense. So I think I think those two. Um, those are two subtly different aspects of this question. Yeah. Another question? Anybody have one that looks fun? If not, I'll throw another one out. Um, here's one for Wilfried, but I think we all can answer this. My question is, when you are going to publish a paper based on niche models, which is the better map to show mean probability of occurrence or the standard deviation? And I think maybe that's a pretty easy question to answer, which is both. Which is to say, we want to know, I, I, I don't want to talk about mean and standard deviation or median and range or some trimmed range, but you always should say, I want to know the central tendency of an answer, and I want to know the variability in that answer. So I could say that, you know, Mona is two meters tall. <laughs> and that is right under some measures of standard deviation or, or range or variability. And it's wrong under other measures of variability. She's closer to two meters tall than zero meters tall. And she's closer to two meters tall than she is to 50 meters tall. Right? If so you I, measure me with... I was gonna say, if you measure me with a two meter stick versus a <laughs> one centimeter stick. <laughs> exactly. Anyhow, um, my point is just that I see it as a gap in what has been published in literally hundreds of papers using niche modeling and distribution modeling techniques that they basically publish a map, which would be something like the mean probability of occurrence. And they very frequently don't publish a map of how certain or how uncertain those probabilities are across that same map. And I see, sometimes I see um, colleagues, collaborators, um, wanting a map that matches, that, that is close to what they had in mind, like a bias, like an observer, I guess, observer or, or researcher bias. I think this map is better than that map. 
and I, to me that it's like why are we why are we doing ecological niche modeling if you already have something in mind uh, now if if you have additional data i understand you know you have additional data you you map the data and you choose the maps that, that you know or the outputs the predictions whatever that best matches available data but just you know your gut sense of what <laughs> what the potential distribution map should look like um, is is something that sometimes yeah sometimes I have to deal with when I work you know with um, students. Uh, there was a um, related to this. There was a I guess somehow there was a question about um, occurrence data. So line twenty three forty three. And I think it's short, and it's un unfortunately it's not you know it's not specifically related to uh, this week's um, presentations. I don't think. Um, okay. So the I can get species the, occurrence data from GBIF. I may also be having a dis additional occurrence data of the same species from field work I conducted. How can I add additional data from the other source? to what GBIF has to boost my occurrence points. So the, my, my suggestion, quick suggestion would be, well, you have additional data that's independent, that could be independent test data. So why not use that as independent test data? However, if it's, if it's additional data from a region that has never been sampled and you know, GBIF doesn't have, does not represent that province or that part of the range, maybe it's not the best idea to use to use these data as independent test data, but if they are, you know, geographically, I guess, widely distributed, I, I think that's a good example or, or a good solution for independent test data. So there was this, this question, which was a little bit strange, but it was, how can we obtain non-independent evaluation data? Can we call independent data those collected in the field during two different monitoring sessions. So it's kind of a related question. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this, this question of independence is a pretty crucial one. And I think the way to approach it is to ask, you know, every, every method that we have of sampling has its little biases. So for example, I may be you know, driving roads and um, observing, let's say, birds along the roads. Well, those roads don't usually go up and over the highest peaks. And they usually cross rivers instead of going along rivers. And so roads have these little environmental biases in them. And so even if you work in totally different provinces or countries, road surveys in those two places may share the same biases. That's true. Um, so I think what you really have to think about is, are there qualitatively different ways to sample such that you don't share biases between samples? And so you could imagine specimen data versus observational data, which oftentimes will have been collected in very different ways. Uh, you could imagine aerial surveys versus ground surveys. You could imagine remote sensing data. Nothing's gonna be perfect and truly independent data can be pretty rare but they are gold, which is to say they give you a, an ability to confirm or uh, disprove a model, a hypothesis that doesn't depend on shared bias. So think about the example I gave of, of mountain peaks. I do my road-based surveys and my road-based surveys give the presence of, of a species everywhere, but at those highest elevations. And then I use, it could be also road-based surveys, it could be whatever, 
but some method that shares the same bias against mountain peaks, I apply those data to test my model. And guess what? Those data also say, well, it's everywhere except on the mountain peaks. And so I can end up confirming a model as having significant or robust predictions based simply on shared bias. Now, hopefully we're not talking about truly ubiquitous species that are in every pixel of our map. Um, but, but you really do have to think about what is independence and independence has to do with how the sampling was assembled and what environmental conditions were included or excluded from that sampling. Yeah. So just gotta I'll, think about it. I'll add the following a little bit what Mona said about where to where we can use the independent data. Uh, I'll just say if you have a way to demonstrate that the other area, the area that is far from the original calibration area, uh, has similar environmental conditions than the calibration area, then perhaps the independent test can be done there. If not, if the range of conditions of multi, uh, like of different environmental conditions in that area is different than what you have in the calibration area, you may be subject to risks derived from what the model does when it extrapolates. So, so if conditions are similar between the calibration area and the projection area that you're interested in, even though they are far from each other, uh, then probably testing with those records, it's it's still okay. But of course we know it's it's complicated to have things like that. Babak, another question you'd like to answer or speak to? Um, actually, there was one. <laughs> I don't know. It, they, they just mentioned that uh, they searched um, that uh, the author of the STM package didn't use um, their package in their publication. <laughs> I just wanted to say that it's, it's not true. We, we use, of course, we may be uh, collaborating in a paper that we are not leading, so it's, uh, the, the the leader may decide or may be more comfortable to use another package. It happened, <laughs> but those are studies that uh, we use actually we use all of the studies that we do as an opportunity to improve the package and add more capabilities to the package. So, and that is just the point. Sorry for that question, but uh, I mean, people have to understand that that yeah. we're all people with long careers, yeah. and you know, some of what you've done was before SDM. Some of it will come after SDM or whatever comes next. And yeah, you know, we collaborate with people who have other frameworks, yes. and. You know, we end up we end up uh, as co-authors occasionally on something sometimes that we even disagree with. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, intellectual contribution is intellectual contribution. Yeah, and sometimes there is like so many options, and like I am developing something, and probably that's not the best option to use for certain things but just for certain things and then you end up using multiple tools like that's not because you don't trust in your things in your package but because like there are other options and there is plenty of people working in in this field and you have also the, your co-authors that you are not the only one making decisions so exactly. and actually that's a good thing to do you, you have to try to pick what you need depending on, on your study yeah imagine if Marlon only ever published with KUENM and Babak only ever published with SDM and Wilfried only ever published with Biomod. We would not be able to speak to one another and we would not be able to 
learn from one another. It may well be that SDM has some has some features that that Biomod or or KENM or Modeler or whichever package could learn massively from or even borrow code from. And you know, it's wonderful that we uh, at least occasionally cross-link and and overlap and and use multiple tools. And, and certainly people learn through their careers. I mean, I have papers from 20 years ago in this area that I would, if I were reviewing right now, I would certainly reject them because I've learned a few things in a decade or so. And, and I do things differently and I, you know, and I'm not embarrassed of it. And I'm also not embarrassed of what I was doing 20 years ago. You know, it's, those, are, those are things that were based on at least my best understanding at the time. And so it wasn't that they were wrong at the time. It's just that since then, um, and mainly through collaborating with colleagues in other labs or students in my lab, Everybody learns things and you evolve and you get better and you do things differently. Natural in the sciences that it works. <laughs> Other questions? We had actually several questions regarding the differences between the difference between biomod to a specific color biomod to an SDM and whether they should be one or uh, I think uh, if I want to answer this question, um, in general, I think both these two specific packages, I think both follow the same principle that is, uh, that is uh, to implement a kind of integrated workflow, integrating different methods in different stages of the species distribution modeling workflow. So it, in that sense, both packages are the same. Uh, and uh, in general also, I think they cover uh, pretty much the same uh, steps in terms of, you know, having, uh, mul uh, using multiple, uh, multiple algorithm in parallel or uh, applying uh, the, the workflow for multiple species you know doing some pre-processing post-processing so i mean in general they are the same so if 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 uh, if you want to make decision for that sense uh, i think the only matter is uh, how comfortable we are with either of these packages on the other hand i think uh, uh, there are some differences if you just go deeper into the packages both packages there are differences there are still under active development i think uh, we are also inspired from each other biomod was kind of the first in the field that tried to integrate these things so uh, me or many other packages probably inspired by biomod too uh, by mode in general, uh, or for example, STM I think was the first use shiny as a as a you know kind of interactive tools, and then now we have uh, several packages that using this stuff. So it's I think a good thing that we are inspired uh, from each other, and then we try to you know contribute in the field. Uh, so. Uh, but but I can confirm that there are uh, unique features that either of these packages have and the other ones uh, don't have. Uh, in STM, we have a kind of kind of ambitious target that uh, uh, it should be a kind of comprehensive framework that covers uh, most of the main things, especially integrating different approaches of modeling. I mean, letting these uh, different approaches coupled to each other. Uh, I should say that uh, I, me, myself, actually, uh, I have like a kind of uh, background in computers and not a formal background, but like a kind of hobby for me from uh, 25 years ago to do programming, database management, whatever. So I learned a lot in that, that uh, you know, in that field. Uh, 
and uh, I was like crazy to, to develop my knowledge. As now my brother is doing PhD in computer science and I'm kind of supervising. So for this one, I tried to use that knowledge to, you know, to, it was very important for me that use a, a state of the art knowledge in computer science to come up with a good design of the things. So there are many details that I didn't cover in the, uh, you know, my talk, it was very simplified. <laughs> There are many details in the background that I think can, provide, I mean, provide a lot of unique features uh, in, in SDM. I can talk about SDM. And it's I, on I, I think there's quite an onus on the user to, you know, explore the different platforms. And you can explore platforms by, you know, watching each of the talks in part in this course. Exactly. Or better yet, reading the papers, you know, reading, especially the papers that present the different platforms. And, you know, as Marlon said earlier, thinking about what's the question I'm trying to answer? What is the, what, what are the requirements of my study? And given that, uh, which of these platforms appears to be the most apt to what I'm trying to do? And it may be that you know certainly one one platform does more in the way of, of model comparison, you know, different comparing different types of of algorithms, and another um, algorithm does more um, kind of deep parameterization of 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 one, uh, or there may be more focus on the whole workflow from obtaining data to producing final models and evaluating them. That, but each of these different platforms brings different strengths, different weaknesses. Um, and really one, we should, we should think about which one we're going to use. And two, we should probably try multiple ones just to, to see, I mean, I wanna know how robust my results are to choosing such and such approach. Exactly. Yeah. And the really interesting thing is, you know, almost everything that is being presented in this course as far as platforms is in R. And so with a little bit of knowledge, which is to say more than what I have, but with a little bit of knowledge of R, you can go in and grab the code for this one thing that you really like pull it over and use that code verbatim. And so you can essentially produce a customized um, workflow or a customized set of analyses using exactly the code that, that was presented by Babak or Wilfried or Marlon or whomever. And Again, the onus is on the user to figure out which is the optimal set of methods. And it doesn't have to be, you know, choose between SDM versus Wallace versus this versus this. It can be pulling the best pieces out of these different approaches and using them flexibly if, if there's a good reason to. I was going to say that the user should also be responsible um, for understanding, you know, when you run ensemble modeling, uh, the user needs to understand what each, alg how to optimize each algorithm. Because um, a lot of times it's, you know, run the default for 100 species and get the average model out for each species and be done. And um, we know from just <laughs> working with one, like max sent, so many parameters that you should be paying attention to, not just run the default. And I think, um, I think there's a pitfall of running multiple algorithms and not really paying attention to what, you, what each algorithm does. And you know, this session started with pseudo absence versus absence, background, you know, logistic regression, and we didn't talk about specifically logistic regression, but what these algorithms require in terms of data and how 
they use that inform these algorithms use that information to create models. So if we just we don't if we don't pay if we don't want to <laughs> invest the time to understand what each algorithm does, then I think that there is the a danger of of making wrong decisions or not making decisions, just running default settings. Yeah, but but as as Mona said, that's on the user. The developers they created the tools already. You just have to use it and invest the amount of time you need to invest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the yeah, fact that, we, go yeah. Go ahead, Baba. Yeah, actually, I wanted to mention another thing that uh, we, we we are mentioning users and developer. One of my dream is like if we make it possible to make these two groups together. That is why, for example. I have some ambitious goal that I make a kind of galleries, uh, online galleries that are linked to the package, the users of package. And then when they study, they just uh, send uh, to the, like uh, the gallery can be on GitHub, for example, and the other users. So I, as a developer can get feedback from them directly based on what they provide and then I can eventually improve uh, based on what's mm -hmm. going on. If we try to, you know, rather than, uh, you know, separately just providing some tools, if we can closely work together to improve uh, and, uh, you know, optimize the things, I think that would be ideal. And very much so. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, over the years, I've been around a bunch of big, um, you know, software development projects. And some of them have done a really good job of creating that, that information flow that you mentioned. You know, developer, user, developer, user. And some of them have done it really badly. And it's really interesting that that latter class can invent some really cool tools and nobody ever uses them. You know, maybe the perfect tool for doing something that the user is never going to want to do. Or it may have a beautiful tool that does something that I'd love to do, but it's plugged into the wrong framework and it does it using the wrong data. You know, for example, there was a super exciting uh, way to manipulate uh, presence absence matrices. It was developed a few years ago. It was really, really exciting. It was something that I could imagine a bunch of papers coming out of. But the only way to use it was via queries to, I guess it was GBIF, and you couldn't put in your own data. And the software was compiled. It wasn't it wasn't source code. And so there was no way even to customize it. And so guess what? Nobody ever used it. So yeah, any, anything that can be done to improve that linkage between kind of the people who are doing development and the people who are using the tools, sometimes it's because the people who are doing development are biologists with their own questions. And sometimes it's because they have students or sometimes it's because they create a platform for that sort of interchange, but that's gonna make the software much better. Any last comment, question, suggestion, idea? We're coming up at the end of the hour. Okay, well, Babak especially, thank you so much for joining us. And Mona and Marlon, thanks as always. And um, week 21 coming up. So uh, have a good week and thanks again, Baba. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice weekend.